Heather, I want to come to you first. So, um, you know, I said at the beginning one thing I wanted to do was to try to help kind of wade through some of the killer robot hype a little bit. Um, because, frankly, as somebody who works regional security, not technical issues, it's honestly hard to kind of actually follow the conversation sometimes and what we should and shouldn't actually be worried about. Um, and the ambassador was talking a little bit about, well, there's fully autonomous systems, there's semi-autonomous systems I hear about, you know, killer robots, but then I hear, well, actually, there are a whole lot of other uses of artificial intelligence. So can you help me understand a bit, when we're talking about um, autonomous weapon systems, what are we actually talking about here? I mean, what should we actually be paying attention to? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Lindsay, um, and thank you uh, for inviting me to, to the event today. Um, I think one of the things that I'm going to vehemently disagree with the ambassador about is the notion that you need to just talk about characteristics and not a definition, because we actually do um, have a, a strong notion of what an autonomous weapon system is. And that is a system that can select and engage targets and use force against those targets. So if you are in the United States and you are part of the DOD, that means that it is a, a weapon system that can select and, a, and engage a target uh, without the intervention of a human operator. If you are part of the ICRC, it is to select an attack um, without the intervention of a human operator. So it's engage or attack is kind of the where things get a little bit murky on the definition side. Um, but it's all of those processes that enable a weapon system to find, locate, track, target, put into an acquisition basket, use force against, um, decide to use force against. I use that decide in, in a... In a in a you know scare quotes way because we're not talking about you know anthropomorphizing of the systems, but when when you're talking about a, a system that can go off, find a target, use force against that target without a human operator pointing, selecting, engaging, clicking, firing. Okay, um, and so this yes, there are definitely semi-autonomous weapon systems in, in, in use today. We have, you know, autonomous flight capabilities. We have autonomous systems and submersibles. Um, but the crux of the matter for lethal autonomy is that select and engage part, right? We don't care if a system can loiter forever by itself. That's not the issue in the United States. That's not the issue in the United Nations. We don't care if it can um, remain indefinitely, you know, in the, in space or under the seas. What we care about is when that decision to use lethal force is enacted. And I say decision, right? Was it a commander that circumscribed an area and said anything within this area is a is a go or a no go? What are the characteristics on which I decide to fire or use lethal force against a target? Is it a signal? Is it a face? Is it just proximity? Is it because you're in this area? So I think those are the kinds of questions that need um, answering. And so when the ambassador says things about we need to talk about human machine teaming, to me that's a ruse. Of course there's humans in warfare. Of course a human is going to deploy a system. These don't just generate de novo. Right? I mean, it's not like a 3D printed drone prints another, th well, yet, prints another <laughs> 3D printed drone and decides to use force against something, right? There's a, there's a human commander at the heart of every single decision to use lethal force. The question is, how removed is that commander from the point in time from that decision to use lethal force? So if I say, this is the big target, Loiter there for three months. Anything that comes in, kill it. That would be a fundamental violation of the international laws of armed conflict because you cannot decide proportionate responses when you have a pre-scripted notion. You don't know if there's civilians inside. You don't know what's happening. You don't know the changes. And so that's where I think with, with understanding killer robots, this is not a humanoid with red eyes despite all of the popular press that you might see about killer robots and terminators. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about systems that can move, locate, target, track, use force against. And that can be in cyber, also not in discussions in the, in the CCW. Let's just put the cyber bit to the side because that's too confusing for diplomats. 
Um, so that can be in cyber, <laughs> and it can As a be non-technical person. I have some empathy with that. <laughs> <laughs> but but in the CC, so this is actually something to 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 keep in mind. And and, and as I'm speaking in my own personal capacity here. Um, I can I can say this with a, a degree of, of of disdain, right? The CCW is hived up into different parts. So legally speaking, so when again when the ambassador says, and I quote, the appropriateness of the CCW, you know what that means? That's taking ownership against the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council and the human rights element of the UN wants ownership of this issue. Mm-mm. Disarmament wants ownership of this issue. So when they say that the CCW, the Convention on Conventional Weapons, is the most appropriate body to discuss this, what they mean is human rights stay out. So I would say that, you know, thinking through this, right, what we have to think about is like this can be in cyber, which of course disarmament, again, thinking in buckets. Cyber goes one place, robots go another. The two shall never, the twixt shall never meet. But in reality, we know that that's not true. When in reality, we know that we already have autonomous cyber weapons deployed. But let us not talk about them because they're not weapons, they're software, they're code, they're this, they're that. You know. So what we have to think about is how you define it. So, okay, so cyber goes over here, robots go over here, CCW goes over here, Human Rights Council goes over here. These are the types of issues that you have to think about when addressing the killer robot discussion. Because it's not a killer robot. It's not like you can find this, put it in a closet, and ban it, and we're all okay. So don't think about the, the killer robot, the Terminator with the humanoid with red eyes. Oh, put him in the closet, ban it. That is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is something that is so much bigger and broader and diffuse and nuanced and so hard to regulate, given the laws of armed conflict as they stand now, when it comes to proportionality, distinction, necessity. Everything that the ICRC stands for, this is really hard to regulate. The dual use nature of the algorithm that's going to run this is the same algorithm that's gonna be running on Siri when you go home and you say, hey Alexa, where's the war today? Hey Alexa, go bomb wherever today. So I think those are the kinds of realistic ideas that you need to put in place. One, that there's a power relation in the UN already. There is power relations between states in the UN, obviously. And the idea, again, quoting our good friend, Ambassador Amandeep, that um, he is going to what did he say? He's going he's gonna to have everybody get together. Nobody is going, he's going to have everybody on board. By the way, for those of you who aren't lawyers or are privy to the CCW, that is actually the protocol of the CCW. Nothing can get done unless everybody agrees. So it sounds all kumbaya, but in reality, it's mandated by the structure of the treaty. And how do you get 194 states to agree? By saying nothing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Um, so there's first the question of you know autonomous you know autonomous weapons, and when we think about them in the UN context, what are some of the sort of legal and ethical questions we need to actually be asking ourselves? One of the other things that I wanted to try to understand, um, Josh, I wanted to turn to you here is. Um, you know, as Heather said, it's not quite as simple as here's, you know, here's a killer robot, put it in the closet, right? Um, and because we're talking about dual use technologies and these technologies can be used in all kinds of different ways. And the reality is they're already being used in all kinds of different ways. Um, and, you know, the U.S. Department of Defense has, has been really out in the lead, I think, in thinking about both how to, um, you know, use autonomy 
um, in the defense sphere, as well as, you know, what are some of the sort of policy and legal questions um, surrounding how we ought to use it. Um, and a lot of it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, big, scary robots with red eyes like we think about. So, you know, for you, what do you see as some of the other projects and places where DOD is most likely to be looking to use autonomy in the future? Thank you for saying that you think we're in the lead. That's nice to hear. Uh, I don't hear that very often. Um, policy-wise, policy-wise. Policy-wise. Right. Policy that's wise. that's probably more accurate. Well, so first let me say um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I have the privilege of running the Defense Innovation Board. Um, so I want to say at the outset that nothing I say uh, reflects the views of the Department of Defense. I'm here speaking only, only for myself, um, informed by the positions that members of the Defense Innovation Board have taken in public. So I'll be summarizing their public statements. Um, that will help me remain employed when I get back to the office this <laughs> afternoon. Um, so what I would say is I, I think about how the department currently is and in the future should employ machine learning and artificial intelligence in really three thematic categories. The first is speed. Uh, the second is precision. And the third is human augmentation. So we think about the, the best and most adjacent applications. It's generally in those three areas. How do we accelerate the pace of our ability to act in the world? Um, but even perhaps more importantly, how do we accelerate the pace of our ability to decide um, and to augment that decision-making process for leaders? Um, how to move more quickly, whether it's moving people, forces, resources, and material into position to be strategically relevant faster, um, or just moving data um, and figuring out how to parse and maneuver um, data into the decision space to inform more accurate uh, but more rapid decision making. And I think as we see the acceleration of both the, the diplomacy and negotiation that precedes armed conflict and then prosecuting armed conflict itself, we should expect to see um, an unprecedented degree of acceleration in the pace at which that operates. Some people have called that hyperwar. Uh, I think uh, artificial intelligence is a key ingredient or accelerant to that transformation. Uh, and one of the things that I think it's very important to understand is if you are competing against an adversary who's operating at machine speed, you really don't want to be operating at human speed. That's not where you want to be. So I think one of the key underlying philosophical uh, drivers here is to understand in strategic competition with an adversary or even just, let's say, another competitor, another actor in the space who's able to operate at that speed, if we simply want to remain relevant to the outcome of that engagement, we need to be able to turn our OODA loop, our observe, orient, decide, act loop at the same speed. And that means we don't really have a choice about the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence or not. If we want to remain in the game, we have to do that. And so um, precision is the second corollary to that. Um, I really appreciate all of the, the different human rights examples that Heather brought up in her opening remarks. Um, I think artificial intelligence gives us the best opportunity that we've had in a generation to increase the precision of warfare, which I hope will save many lives. Um, particularly civilian lives, but also better protection for our own forces. The ability to be more precise and more accurate in our judgments and to use more data and more evidence in informing our judgments and our intelligence assessments are all things that I think AI and machine learning will do to help. And so my hope is, is that properly applied, these technologies actually reduce the human cost of war, not increase it. And last is human augmentation. And I think all of the examples about the far-fetched nature of these killer robots um, is, is really apropos of the real issue here, which is that we're not trying to replace humans in most cases, right? What we're trying to do is augment the ability of humans to make better decisions, to make faster decisions. And that, that is really, at least with the present state of technology, I think that's the most relevant outcome. So what I would like to see in those three themes is um, certainly uh, our continued work on computer vision, which is a very mature technology that the department is trying to figure out how to apply. Um, Project Maven is one where we're trying to apply computer vision um, to full motion video. We've done that quite successfully. There's been lots of reporting about that. We're very public about that. Um, but natural language processing is another. Um, certainly the intelligence analysis applications are pretty considerable. If you just think of the ability to use change detection software when you're dealing with millions of images being collected every day, you really can't make use of that information without um, change detection software, which again is, is not, uh, not the stuff of science fiction that's present today. 
Um, automation of tasks, something that's very mature in the commercial world, is something that the department is now beginning to figure out how to do to improve the efficiency of some of our business operations and business functions. Um, and I won't speak more about autonomy, but obviously the Department of Defense is very interested in autonomy across all domains, cyber especially, but certainly um, everywhere that we have a human operator, I think there's a lot of value in thinking about whether we could be faster and more precise if we could um, augment that human operator, or in some cases where it's appropriate, replace that human operator. Um, and then the last area where I think you're going to see um, a significant increase in use of these systems is in various forms of automated defense. So, I mean, Heather mentioned um, automated defense for uh, a cyber attack. Um, I would say that a modern distributed denial of service attack um, is impossible to defeat without some automation of your cyber defense. Um, so, you know, we don't need to be speculative about this. We'll simply say, if you can imagine a nation state or, or even a, a non-state actor using a sophisticated distributed denial of service attack against an asset in the civilian world or the military world that we care about, if you don't protect that asset with some degree of automation and autonomy, that asset is going to be vulnerable and only increasingly so. But the other place where we look at it is in a much more complicated area, which is the, you know, just the physics around missile defense. If you want to be able to protect yourself against a hypersonic missile threat, um, realistically, you're going to have to automate a lot of that defense. So I think a very important policy distinction we need to make is automating defense versus automating offense. And so if you make that initial distinction, um, it greatly simplifies a lot of your legal and ethical concerns. Um, there is simply no way to fulfill our constitutional mandate to protect uh, our, this, the people of this country or our forces abroad or our allies without automating certain aspects of defense. Um, the thornier issues are autom- is you know, you know, when those defensive weapons can be used as offensive weapons as well. Thanks, Josh. Um, Satyasan, I want to come to you because, uh, you know, a lot of times I think in the United States, we're very focused on the conversations that are happening here in the U.S. Um, And even a lot of times in the press, you see a lot of discussion about what's going on in China. Um, But frankly, I think all countries are starting to wrestle with, um, you know, how do we incorporate autonomy uh, into our defense plans? Um, And Japan in particular has some, you know, complicated decisions here, right? Because um, we hear Josh talking about, you know, do we automate defense or offense? Well, for Japan, um, you know, there's, do we have offense is is a part of the question as well. Um, so as Japan goes forward, um, can you say a little bit about how you see Japan beginning to wrestle with some of the decisions about um, incorporating autonomous systems uh, into its defense? Because it's certainly investing money um, in emerging technologies and in R&D. Um, and Japan obviously has extremely advanced robotic sector. Um, so I'd like to hear you say a little bit about, you know, from the policy you decide, what does the debate look like in Japan? Well, thank you very much, Lee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, conference. Uh, the Japan case, it's, as, as you know, a little, little bit complicated than uh, maybe the rest of the uh, dis- discussion in the United States. Uh, we are actually uh, starting to actually to debate about what autonomy and autonomous uh, would be, would look like, uh, what weapon would look like. And uh, what would be the element technology would look like in uh, incorporating the technology into the weapon system? But uh, looking broadly within the Japanese uh, uh, security uh, discussion is that uh, 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 the f- technology and weapon system can be divided in a sense that uh, as uh, 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 Heather has mentioned, Dr. Heather has mentioned that uh, we have the targeting, uh, engage, and uh, uh, search uh, are, uh, has, has, uh, in, uh, uh, is, is autonomous weapons function within a single system. But uh, looking at the Japanese def- uh, defense uh, argument at large is that they are trying to divide the uh, uh, function of the AI or autonomous uh, technology and the weapon system differently. So that, the, as you, as Anand uh, uh, mentioned earlier, that the killer robots and autonomous weapon is not present at this moment. So that uh, we have still a lot of time to discuss about the different distinction between autonomy and uh, uh, autonomy and autonomous, and the what AI brings uh, to this discussion is that uh, as you know that uh, 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 we need speed, precision, and a, a, a human uh, uh, what was it? what was the term? 
human augmentation is very important in, in, in uh, our current weapon system. But the, uh, uh, still, we, have the, uh, we sh may have some distinct uh, different in technology sense about uh, uh, distinction between the auto autonomy, autonomy and autonom autonomy and autonomous. So Japan's discussion currently, I think, is focusing on the autonomy side, not on the uh, autonomy side, not on the autonomous side. And in 2016, uh, uh, ADLA, Japan's uh, Defense uh, uh, Logistics and Research Arms of the uh, MOD, has issued a report saying that uh, they are interested in uh, autonomy, but the uh, autonomous uh, weapons, which requires uh, a sophisticated AI, a technology, and a lot of data gathering, is, is premature for us to, to, uh, imp uh, to incorporate those technology to become the weapon system itself. So we, we, uh, our debates stop, uh, uh, are developing now, but uh, our, 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 if I uh, our, our formulate a di uh, discussion in Japan, that is what the MOD is talking about. But the civilian sector is totally different. As you know, that we have a sophisticated robot technologies, we have many uh, researchers on, on AI, but if we if we listen to the uh, discussion within the AI community in uh, in the civil uh, 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 civil sector, uh, uh, they think that uh, we are far behind the AI technology compared to the U.S. On, or, or China. So we don't have yeah, we are not on the same table to discuss about the future AI application to the weapon system at this moment. So they are trying to uh, catch up, actually, at this moment, to in the, in the field of applied technologies uh, sphere, and uh, uh, we will see what happens. Okay. <laughs> so the discussion just started. Uh, okay. Moment, I think. So trying uh, trying to catch up, um, Shashank. I want to I want to actually turn to you there because um, you've um, suggested that perhaps India has some catching up that maybe it needs to do. And um, you've actually said that you've argued that maybe it, India should be um, trying to think about how it could leverage autonomous weapon systems because um, there would be all kinds of advantages. And um, Josh has you know, discussed some of the reasons that the Department of Defense here in the U.S. is thinking about autonomy. You've suggested even places like perhaps on contested borders, this is where we might want to be putting autonomous weapons rather than people. Um, India has a new task force, uh, a defense task force on AI, which you sit on, as well as a broader AI task force, which um, the ambassador mentioned. So can you talk to me a bit about India's policies and yeah. where they're headed? Sure. So uh, thank you again for calling me. Uh, so for India specifically, it's necessary to know that technologically, uh, India is significantly behind the US, China, Japan, Israel, and all. But in the last six to eight months, there's been a lot of interest and activity in the potential of AI for Indian defense and national security. And it comes down to primarily two reasons. The first is uh, external the fact that China is doing so much uh, means that even if a vast majority of Indian policymakers do not understand what autonomous weapons are or what artificial intelligence is, like they say, okay, fine, China's doing this, this will increase the gap, so we need to do this. Now let's figure out what we mean by doing this, right? Uh, so, so that's broadly the thinking right now, which is why these task forces have been established and all of them in the last three to f four months. The second is internal in that uh, the Indian mm, no, army specifically mm. faces a very unique situation in that it's manpower costs are ballooning mm. right uh, so the so as of the last budget the pension bills are actually more than the expenditure on on capital acquisition on 
new on acquiring new systems and which becomes a big problem going forward because if you spend more than 60 percent of your defense budget on just paying pensions. Yeah, tell me about it. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, it's a real bummer. (laughs) Yeah, it it really is. So so now you have all these generals and uh, uh, bureaucrats in the Ministry of Defense who are trying to look at AI as one of the potential new technologies that could help uh, uh, India if not uh, become the global leader, at least retain a defensive edge. Mm-hmm. Again, this is basically vis-a-vis China, right? It's not uh, anything else. Now, coupled with these is a third issue in that if you look at the geography of India, its borders are really, really unique, right, in that, so so our border with China is almost 3,000 kilometers, most of it is contested, and all of it is just mountains, like really high mountains. The cost of just putting a small patrol of 20 soldiers, right, for a month in those mountains is excessively high, right? And you've had our border with Pakistan as mountains, desert, uh, plains. And if you look at some specific areas, India and Pakistan, as you know, there's always been a tussle over the Siachen Glacier. And since 19... 85, when India took over the glacier, right? I think about 900 Indian soldiers have died on the glacier, but all of them from frostbite, right? From avalanches, right? From uh, a variety of uh, climate issues. None of them, not a single one from a Pakistani bullet, right? So so this becomes a big issue in that, like, you can't justify the deaths of your own soldiers, like, right. to your domestic audience. So in these, so if you take all of these together, I think there is a very strong use case for India, right? At least defensively, mm-hmm. right, to invest in some form of autonomous weapons, like whether it's for border patrol, right, it's for, uh, in uh, uh, Kashmir, the insurgency is still going on, right? So last year, I think we had about 200 Indian soldiers like who died, uh, quite a few of them from attacks on Indian army bases. So for uh, protection of our Bases, right? Uh, for maritime security, right? Because the Indian Navy is starting to play a bigger role in the mm-hmm. Indian Ocean region, right? But again, the army gobbles up most of our expenditure, right? right? In which, so the Navy can't really invest in new battleships or subs the way that it would like. Right, in which case, I think there is a really strong use case. Mm-hmm. Right. So, of course, this must be done, right, keeping in mind the legal, ethical, and international law right. concerns. Right. But at least from a defensive perspective, I do think there's a really strong use case, like okay. for at least certain forms of autonomy to be incorporated by the Indian right. military. So, Josh, one thing that strikes me listening um, to Shashank's comments, um, and I'd, you know, I'd like your thoughts on this, the, the elephant in the room, to some extent, that, that's come up in a lot of the comments, right, is, is China. 
And um, you know, <laughs> you you said, oh, you think we're ahead. Um, so <laughs> one of the um, you know one of the things you see in the press a lot is this sense that um, you know the U.S. is advancing its technologies. China is doing the same, that there's a bit of a competition there, that other countries in Asia are increasingly looking at that as well and thinking, okay, now how do I advance my technologies? Um, so, you know, one, I guess, um, are, is this what we're heading towards, an intensifying sort of um, competition um, around arms that's increasingly in the technological space? Um, and two, you know, is is DOD concerned they're behind? Does the U.S. feel it's behind in this race? I won't You're answering use the in phrase, your personal capacity. In my personal capacity, <laughs> I won't use the phrase uh, arms race, but I will say that it, it should be clear to everyone we are in a strategic competition. And technology has always played a central role in these competitions. Um, the, the, the technology that will define our era is going to be this one. It's going to be artificial intelligence. Um, the, the board wrote over a year ago, I think memorably, and I was flattered you quoted it, that we think this will be as destabilizing as nuclear weapons. Um, so this is significant. I mean, this is table stakes. This is, this is the prize. This is what you got to get after. So I won't comment on whether we are behind or not, but I will lay out some facts that I think should frame the discussion. Um, we don't we don't today have a clearly articulated strategy for how we are going to pursue dominance in the field of artificial intelligence for national security purposes. The United States does not. The United States does not today have that. Uh, China does have that. Um, China has made announcements about their investments in this area. Um, they are considerable financial investments. It's a considerable proportion of their investments, suggesting that it's a, it's a real priority for them. I don't think that the defense budget that we have requested reflects the same sense of urgency. It certainly doesn't reflect the same investment. Um, we invest uh, quite a bit in these technologies. Um, I've seen public estimates of anywhere between $600 million a year to $7 billion a year. <laughs> Um, the fact that, that those are such widely varying numbers tells you a lot in terms of how much detail we have in understanding and characterizing these investments and calculating what we think the return on that investment is in terms of capability delivered. So from a strategic uh, focus, from a clearly defined, well-articulated priority and action plan from an investment standpoint, all these areas would suggest not necessarily that we're behind, um, but that China is doing an awful lot, and I'm not as sure that we know exactly what it is that we're doing. One thing that I think you really have to consider in this competition, right, is um, democracies and nations like China operate very differently um, in, in, in many respects. But one of the respects that's most significant in this area is that our greatest strength is our capitalist system. But our capitalist system really defines the way in which our military mm -hmm. relates to our industry. And our industry is by far the very best in the world in this field. We have a significant lead and advantage economically as a society because of the strength of our companies. However, the relationship between those companies and our military industrial complex and our military uh, is not as uh, well managed. Um, I'll leave it at that. So we, we have a defense industrial base, um, but we also have in this new national defense strategy coined, I think, a really important term, which is a national innovation base, which is, I think, a really important distinction. And when we look at where these advances in American society and American academia and American business are taking place, they are taking place in what we would characterize as the innovation base, but they are very slow to penetrate the industrial base, and they're slower to penetrate the government itself, and the military. Contrast that with China's position, mm -hmm. right? They have civil-military fusion, a terrifying concept if you really understand what it means. They have eliminated this friction. They have seamless and total uh, control under, under their authoritarian system, which gives them an immense advantage. So 
American business versus Chinese business and AI, America has a great advantage. Chinese military versus US military, that's a really different picture. And again, I won't characterize it by saying we're behind, but I will say again, that's a really different picture and one that all citizens should be very concerned about. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, which I think is the most important and underappreciated insight in this competition, and that is data. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Defense Innovation Board's view on this is that we should look at data much the way we have looked at oil and coal in terms of being a determinant of geopolitical competition. So when Putin talks about the nation state that harnesses AI is going to be the, the dominant power, I would recalibrate that statement slightly and say the first nation state to amass the most data and exploit it for military advantage will be the global hegemon because you need all that data to train your algorithms. And so if you look at this from a geopolitical competition for control of data, think about who has access to the most data and how is that data used. The fact that the West respects the privacy of its citizens gives it an immense disadvantage in the race to accumulate the most data. So the example I like to use is, if you decide that there's a military advantage to facial recognition, and everyone in China is looking at a phone and the government can have a snapshot of anything that that camera can see, and they can use that data for any purpose they want, their algorithms are gonna be trained faster and more accurately than ours. So I think that's really important to think about the way our capitalist civil liberty respecting Western set of democracies will develop algorithms, develop AI, use this technology and fight with this technology versus the way a nation state like China or Russia would use that technology. That is something that our strategists need to be thinking about over the long term. Because if we lose an advantage in this area, there could be a tipping point where we're not able to catch up. And that could have long-term effects that spill over into every other aspect of geostrategic competition. And that is not a world in which we would like Americans to grow up in. Okay, Heather. Yeah, just to, to double down, um, I mean, I, I completely agree with, with everything that, um, that you said. There's three things that I think everybody needs to know about AI. Um, and three things about where you go with domination and, and, and getting with AI. One is the power to compute. You need, com you need computational power. You need the data. And you need expertise. Right? Those are the three ingredients to any good AI. And the thing about data, and, and, and I completely agree that you know the more data, the better. And frankly, when you think about the relationship between Baidu and um, and the Chinese government, this is a completely different type of relationship than Google and, and the United States, right? Um, or Amazon or Facebook or any other Microsoft, IBM, you know, name the big five. These are very different relationships with the U.S. government than, than Baidu has with, with China. Um, they have data, they have compute, and they have expertise. And data is going to become, it is, it is already a gold currency, but it is also going to become, I think, in the future, less relevant. And this is where I would disagree. Because we are going to use machine learning algorithms to train on things with fewer and fewer examples of data. So I'm not going to have to have 10,000 episodes with hundreds of millions of of, of images to get where I want to go. I might have four, right? And not only that, I can compress that data. I can make it fewer, I can make it compressed, and I can make it faster. And when you add in the thing that has not been discussed today, quantum, <laughs> we're, ha we're like host, okay? China has a significant lead on quantum than we do. They have invested much more heavily. They have partnerships with other institutions and other countries. They have already successfully demonstrated a quantum key distribution from space to Beijing. Do you think about quantum encryption? Think about getting actually getting to quantum supremacy and breaking all of the encryption that we currently have. All of your telephones, all of your bank accounts, 
however you want to do it, done, right? Diplomatic cables, over. You think WikiLeaks was bad? <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously, folks, like, if, if, if there is a break, if, if, if quantum breaks the current key distribution in, in, in encryption, we are all housed. And, you know, the, the other thing that I would say about this is, you know, so you have, you have the quantum problem, you have the machine learning problem, you have the robotics problem, you have the autonomous weapons problem, you have the democracy versus autocracy problem, and you have the general power play between resources problem. China has done a very good job. If you want to think about, you know, the big boogeyman in the closet, and we're going to, you know, talk about that in, in, the, in these terms, they have done a very good job for the last 40 years of what's called the going out strategy. They have gone out, they have invested in other countries, they have built infrastructure, and they have taken resources. And if you think that your lithium ion battery right now is only going to be made by Apple, and Apple has a corner on the market of cobalt, you're wrong. And so there is going to be a serious race between environment, data, ML, AI, robotics, you name it. And we have to think in terms of, of, of geopolitical thinking, of strategic thinking, not thinking in terms of, oh, it's Russia, it's a Cold War, it's ideology. No, 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 no. It is so much more complex than that. And then you think about the proxies, and then you think about the alliances, and then you think about Asia, and you think about where everybody else sits, where India will come in, where Japan will come in. I mean, Japan hosts the Fifth Fleet. This is, a, this is a strategic asset that is all choke points in the South China Sea. They're the ones that patrol it. What if you had a really quiet sub that outbeats all of, exactly. Can, can, I, can I sound a more optimistic note? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a Debbie Downer. I'm a super <laughs> Debbie Downer. So, you, you have other uh, questions, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it. I tell you what, I'm gonna give you one minute for an optimistic note and then I'm gonna let these guys ask questions. So okay, okay. Give me okay. some fast optimism. Fast optimism is, so, um, so everything that Heather said is true, but there's also a very positive side here, which is um, the, the availability of technologies that used to only be the prize for the most expensive, heavily resourced uh, military industrial complexes has made these technologies diffuse. And that is actually an important uh, boost for security. So I would say, you know, what we used to spend trillions of dollars to develop in the United States to give us the ability to have overhead imagery around the world is now available through Planet Labs or other commercial vendors and through Google Earth. And now any military right, or any humanitarian watchdog group can have its own ISR platform similar to what the United States used to have. So when I think about how would we constrain, hypothetically, let's say an aggressive Chinese action, you know, in the maritime <coughs> domain, right, the Vietnamese Navy Right, has the ability to, if they choose to, do incredibly sophisticated uh, in, you know, sur uh, surveillance and reconnaissance using commercially available assets without having to have any vulnerable or, or complex or sophisticated investment um, in, in, in spy satellites. Right? There's a lot that's available now for everyone to use. And so I think a really powerful diplomatic move for those who are concerned about the dismal future that, um, that Heather and I have been ripping about <laughs> is, is that we can actually empower a lot of partners and allies with technology that's cheaper than it ever has been. And I'd like to see us think about how we could use those technologies to empower those allies in a coalition. And the reason why it's powerful is if they choose to share data. I mean, right now, things like maritime domain awareness are really hampered by a lack of information sharing. If data is as important as it is, the ability to share that data and to create a shared data architecture could actually enable us to have incredibly powerful partnerships that would enable very rapid coalition response to, um, you know, let's say an, an overflight violation or treaty violations on fisheries or, or other things. So it's mostly bad, but there are silver linings like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.
silver lining uh, from the mostly bad situation. Um, I'm going to uh, turn it open now to questions. What I'll do is if folks can raise their hands, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to try to group questions, um, and then we'll address them to the panelists. So we've got folks in the back with microphones, if anybody has a question. Right here. Hi. Uh, Dan White from the German Marshall Fund. My question is more kind of for Josh. What would it take for to see in the future from the Defense Department to see what we have with the nuclear posture review in the same realm that we would have for the AI? <laughs> Interesting question. Thanks. Uh, other questions right now? No? Okay, well, we'll start with that one. Go ahead. So I think that there's, uh, so first of all, well, I can't comment on them. There are a number of policy reviews that are ongoing to address this issue. So uh, I think that uh, others have, uh, outside of the department, have contributed to this dialogue and have gotten those inside the department to, to pay additional attention to this. And I think there's some references to in the National Defense Strategy, the, the, the publicly available version, the unclassified version, that lays some groundwork for this, and there are some other documents that may be forthcoming that would get at this. So I don't think that it's absent, um, but I do think that you know the Chinese have stolen a march on us, and that they they came out with this with a strategy you know sooner. So I would say I think we are moving in the right direction, and I think we're going to see um, see changes, particularly I hope uh, changes to budget. Um, in the near future. What we have recommended, um, and the Defense Innovation Board publicly recommended this, it's a recommendation number five on our website, um, is to establish a center for artificial intelligence. The reason why that's so important is because, um, I'll just say three things quickly and move to the next question. The first is, to do this well, there's a certain amount of shared infrastructure that you need to do this efficiently. And that infrastructure for, for computation and data sharing cloud computing largely doesn't exist in the department today. So while we do have very exciting projects going on in in parts of the department, DARPA, Air Force Research Laboratory, other places, Strategic Capabilities Office, um, USDI doing great things, we don't have the ability to have that algorithm library or to have that that reference library of um, well-classified and characterized data that we would use to train algorithms we we don't have that. Um, so that so the first thing that a center would do is create some of that common architecture. Uh, another I think important feature would be the ability to have that expertise and to bring in people that could help the services figure out how to field these algorithms. I would say you know we have we have tremendously capable scientists and researchers in our research and development enterprise in the department. It's an $80 billion R&D budget, right? But how well are we figuring out how to bring those systems online to help warfighters tomorrow with mature, commercially available technology? And so I think it would be interesting to create sort of a centralized place with a focus on fielding technology as opposed to over the horizon 5, 10, 15 years out. Um, So I'll, I'll pause there, but I think those would be the two areas where I would want them to focus. Other questions? That one right back here. My name is Uride. My question is for Hida Ruff. Uh, with all that you have said about China, I'm just wondering what is the security architecture in the Asian region with China dominating the, from what you have said, it's like China quantum and all this, China is dominating. What is the security architecture in Asia, and how can it be balanced with the other countries you have, India, Japan, and others? How can it be balanced? What is current security architecture in Asia, and how can we balance with the other countries? So Asian security architecture, um, existing security architecture, how does it apply as we think about some of the challenges in in autonomy and AI? Tell you what, I'm going to let Heather answer, but I'm actually going to ask um, Sato-san and Shashank to answer that question too, because I think from the Japanese and Indian perspective, they'll have um, some good insights there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I make no um, claims to be an Asian expert. Um, I'm an expert on weapons and uh, law and ethics, and that's what I do. But I would say that, um, you know, hearkening back to my days as a graduate student in political science, um, you know, when we think about our alliances in the region, 
um, that would really kind of dictate the security architecture, at least from the US perspective. Um, and to kind of throw the question back at you, um, there's not, there's an assumption in your question about balancing that means that balancing is good. Yeah, no. Um, but let me finish. So, I mean, this is, this is a classic balance of power theory, right? Like once you have a balance between all the powers, yeah. it's stable, yeah. right? But that's actually not necessarily a correct theory. In fact, we have um, evidence of hegemonic stability. We have evidence of bipolar stability. And so, again, I, I would say that, like, you know, finding balance in the region and empowering others and giving others more weapons or more arms or more economics or more whatever may, in fact, actually be destabilizing. Um, and so while I do fear a lot of what's happening coming out of China right now, um, particularly because Xi Jinping has just been made emperor for life, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot of, of silver lining coming out of this. Like, I mean, it keeps me up at night, you know. Um, I have to have a glass of wine before bed, you know. <laughs> like, but, you know, there's, I don't, I don't know if um, just because of China's rise, it will necessarily be um, belligerent because they may just quash people before they actually have to fight. So I think in, in trying to balance it, you might actually invite conflict. So Sasha san let me ask you from an alliance perspective, mm -hmm. Um, how do you how do you better leverage? Where are the opportunities to leverage alliances mm -hmm. um, as we think about not just the China question, but I would say also um, the broader question of as technology advances, um, how do we actually mitigate against destabilizing impacts of it? Yeah, the uh, actually to to, uh, uh, to confess, I was the, one of the panelists at the uh, November GGE last year, and uh, at the podium, I was asked from the uh, some uh, certain uh, countries that how do you think about strategic stability on AI and laws, and my answer to that was it is too immature to answer that question, because the uh, 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 when when you talk about the balance, uh, you ha you can talk either. Uh, you can talk about numbers, you can talk about qualities, and, 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 and in addition, you, you talk about perceptions. Mm -hmm. And the alliance system, what we need to talk about, is mostly a, a, about the perception and the confidence uh, to the uh, uh, actual uh, uh, cap cap capability of forces that allies bring together. So the, the important point here, talking about balance, on the AI field of AI is that the AI cannot be counted. AI cannot be evaluated in terms of uh, technology because you know there are many uh, different technology bases or many different uh, technology data and level of machine learning might be different. So we cannot simply argue that yeah, uh, uh, AI, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, make a balance between China with regard to the uh, uh, AI uh, equipped weapon is, uh, I think, a relevant question, at least at this point to, uh, to, to address. But what is more important in the Japanese uh, security argument is that uh, we, are, we are having the perception that China is dominating in this field, China is dominating on the civilian sector with, uh, uh, with the help of civil military infusion. Infusion, uh, is that correct? Uh, fusion. And last year, we are talking with Germans that how to regulate the China's inbound investment to our countries. And the NATO's, uh, uh, excuse me, the EU countries were more, more, uh, were more, more, more or, or concerned about what's happening uh, with regards to the Chinese investment. But the, uh, 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 we cannot regulate the uh, commercial activities done by the commercial companies. So what is important for us is, at, at this point at least, is to monitor uh, what the, the, the directions and the uh, 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 qual, qual, uh, quantity of Chinese investment is going to, in what direction, and what they're trying to uh, uh, accomplish with their acquired capabilities. And uh, with that, 
we need to uh, 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 make. We, I, I'm not trying to uh, uh, articulate that we should go uh, into the Cold War with China. Uh, well, with, but with, with the uh, alliance system currently exists with center center uh, uh, in U.S. is that uh, we have to find our joint, you know, uh, capacity to deal with the emerging emerging threat, maybe uh, in the Asia uh, Pacific uh, security context. In that regard, I think that Japan I, I independently cannot. Uh, deal with Chinese, you know, advanced uh, cap capabilities, maybe. But uh, if we joined with the U.S. and we, 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 if we strengthen our relationship with South Korea, U.S. and other countries in the region, we may have, uh, uh, we may reach certain amount of perception that we are very confident with uh, the security architect architecture that we are bringing into in this region. And Shashank, I'm, and I'm going to in the interest of time, wrap up with you here. But And we were talking about this upstairs, actually. Um, an interesting development that came out this last week actually was uh, the announcement that India is actually going to be putting, I don't know if liaison officer is the right word, but a liaison officer essentially um, into uh, the US Defense Innovation Unit uh, X, DIUX, which sort of looks at how do we um, begin to work private sector uh, together with public sector, you know, on technologies. Mountain View. Uh, in Mountain View, right. So, um, you know, maybe this is uh, where we're headed is increasingly partners beginning to think how to work together. If you think that's, you know, from India's perspective. So from India's perspective, I can tell you that that is exactly what India is thinking. So if you look at the report of the task force that the ambassador was on, it explicitly calls for collaborations right, with other countries, right, uh, with friendly countries. The terms of reference of the task force that I'm on also looks at collaborations yeah. with other countries. And I think across the board, uh, policymakers in India have realize that India has certain advantages, right? So we do have the the data, at least in terms of quantity, if not in terms of quality, right? We do have a skilled engineering uh, force that can be retrained if need be to meet this. But we do not have a Google or a Baidu that can actually take the lead in this, right? So we do not actually have uh, any industry body that can take the lead in this. So in which case, the only other way to go about it, right, is to develop closer economic and policy relations with the US, Israel, Japan, right, to figure out a way both for ourselves and for the global. And this is independent of China, right? Mm -hmm. An offshoot of this could be that it works out as a balancing act, maybe, right? But this is completely independent of China, right? Is that India needs to invest in greater technology collaborations, both at the technology level itself and at the policy level, right? Uh, so for India specifically, this is at least now the thinking, right? This is the only way to go about it if India needs to advance in any meaningful way in the next decade or so. Right. Right. Okay, um, with that, I'm going to ask you all uh, to please help me um, thank our panel for a great discussion today. I appreciate it so much.